Do you want to hit record? This meeting is being recorded. Got it. <laughs> okay, hello everyone and welcome to this exciting virtual speaker event um, hosted by the Penn Moviegoer. If you're not involved with us, we're a student-run publication sponsored by the Kelly Writers House here at Penn and we provide insightful coverage of popular culture, including movies and television. Today, we're so excited to welcome Catherine McMahon for a live Q&A session. Kat has years of experience across many industries, including media, film, and entertainment. Um, and I will now turn it over to Matt to introduce our amazing speaker. So thanks, Haley. Um, and I'm like super, super happy for this. Uh, full disclosure, Kat and I used to work together very, very closely at the New York Times and have remained firm friends ever since, even though our lives are in different places. Uh, Kat was one of my favorites uh, when I worked there, and I'm sure we're in for a, a really great presentation and a lively Q&A. Kat's a fantastic resource to talk to about careers, uh, careers in media, but just so, also like how to navigate media organizations uh, and sort of how to, you know, how to approach them, how to apply to them, and how to thrive within them. Um, Kat's bio reads as uh, as Haley said that she's a that, that she's an operations program management and immersive storytelling expert. Uh, by day, she's the senior program manager of strategy and operations in the LinkedIn newsroom, as we were just it was, as we were just learning, and also runs Barkstone, an Airbnb just off the Appalachian Trail that was built in 1759. So not just not just a career, but also thriving outside. And speaking of outside stuff, uh, Kat's uh, wishes she's, she's going to talk to about us, uh, talk to us about tonight. Kat's the executive producer of operations for Barbecue Films, an Emmy-nominated event production company that creates immersive experiences based on beloved stories from film and television. Um, they have produced everything from an e-coin launch party for Mr. Robot to a night of guided debauchery with Terry Kaiser for Weekend at Bernie's, to taking people back in time to the enchantment under the sea dance for Back to the Future. And one of my favorites when I first met Kat was uh, um, a vampire rave with a full sort of blood dance floor, uh, a kind of extravaganza, which I'm, uh, I'm hopeful we'll get some stories uh, about tonight as well. So Kat, um, welcome to the moviegoer. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, and please, the, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I will also say that Matt is one of my favorite people to have ever worked with. Um, and I, I mean, he and I are on a group text chain that has texted at least twice a week for the past six years. So since you left uh, the time. So um, I'm very excited to be here and really excited. Um, to get to talk about movies and films and storytelling. Um, and so let's let's just get in. I'm gonna make a, a jump. I'm gonna make an assumption that everyone here has seen the movie Back to the Future. Okay, all right, great. Um, so I want you now to imagine instead of watching Back to the Future on your couch or at a movie theater, you get to watch Back to the Future in a gymnasium that was built in 1950. And everybody in line and everybody in the audience is wearing their 1950s high school prom best. And when you came in, when you were waiting in line to come in, you walked by a DeLorean that was parked outside and you saw some really old, very crazy lady trying to, to get money to save the clock tower. And as you walked through the door, you were stopped and you had to stand there with a group and you saw the flux capacitor and you traveled back in time to 1950. And when you walked into the gymnasium, there was a wall of bubbles coming down and you looked around and you saw the King Neptune statue. There was a stage where there was a band playing songs from the fifties and hit songs from, from our time, but in the 1950s style. And as you're walking around, you stop, you get a drink, all of a sudden one of Biff friends, you know, comes and cuts in the dance and takes you away from your dance partner. You get in trouble with Principal Strickland, you get a detention slip, he takes you to his office along with a couple of other people. And that same hooligan that cut into the dance hands you a little sip of whiskey while Strickland's back is turned while he's lecturing you about behaving. You finally get to go back to your seat and the film starts. 
And as you're sitting there, you're watching the screen, you're enjoying this movie with all of these super fans, you get to the point where Marty McFly takes the stage and all of a sudden the lights come up in the gymnasium and standing on the stage is Marty McFly with the band and they play Earth Angel and you get to see Lorraine and George dance there. And as they go through the songs and he starts to play Johnny Be Good, he doesn't just end there. It's been extended and you get to take the songs. You get to go from Johnny Be Good through this medley of music that takes you through all of the decades up to you know, present day. And you get to hear, you know, ACDC and Nirvana and, uh, you know, Katy Perry. It wasn't Katy Perry, but for example, all of those things. And everyone is out of their seats and they're screaming and dancing and it's so exciting. And then we finish the song, we clap, we get to sit down and we take that energy in to watch the rest of the film. And as you leave at the end of the night, you have, you know, your, your poster that you get to take home, you have your, you know, cup, your, your take home cup, and you get to talk to your friends about what they did because their experience was different than yours. They, you know, they didn't get to go and, and get yelled at by Principal Strickland, but they did get to go with, with Biff's gang and pick on some other kids, or they were sitting there with George and they were pumping him up to really, really be able to punch Biff in the face later um, and really save, save the timeline. And so everybody comes out, you have your different stories, and this is something that you can look back on and share for years to come. And so that's, that's, back, that's barbecue films. You don't just watch a movie. You didn't just watch Back to the Future. You live it. Um, so, okay, now that you have that premise, I'm going to share my screen and kind of go through some of the, the more logistical pieces of barbecue films with you. All right. So now I've said all of this, I've painted the picture. The best way for you all to understand what barbecue films does is probably to see a little bit about our events and see an example. So I'm going to play this clip and let me know if you can't hear the sound, okay? Yeah, I don't hear it, Kat. Yeah, I don't think we can hear the screen sound. Oh, it, no. Kat. You might have to mute yourself. Oh, do, okay, I will mute myself. And there might be like an option at the top. Okay, I will, I will troubleshoot this, but we can keep going and I can send you these the links to this video afterwards. They're all publicly available. Awesome. Um, also, like if we can't hear the sound, I think we get a pretty good sense of this without it. If you want to play it anyway. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, this is good. You get to see some different clips. Um, so we'll go ahead and play this and I'll see if I can change anything in my settings so that you can hear the, the music. Yeah, so this is our Ghostbusters HQ event. This is Empire Records, Rex Manning Day. Um, and that is Guar and Ethan Embry. This is the Blade Rave that Matt was talking about. Weekend at Bernie's uh, was a personal favorite. We'll talk about that a little more. Terry Kaiser, Bernie himself taught us all how to do the Bernie lean. And of course, Wayne's World. Uh, and we had Calico Cooper, who is Alice Cooper's daughter, um, come and perform with our band, Mean Girls, and Mr. Robot. Um, we did an event with Showtime for Twin Peaks for the new uh, Twin Peaks launch. This is Back to the Future. Um, and 
And so that's that's a little bit about barbecue films and I'll, I'll send that link out to you um, just so you can see it, but you can really see that each of the events is in its own special location. Everyone shows up and is part of the story and, and comes ready to play. Um, so like Matt said in the introduction, barbecue films uh, creates immersive cinematic experiences in extraordinary locations. The passionate multidisciplinary film crew brings our favorite movies to life via themed screenings complete with interactive installations, food and beverage pairings, and live entertainment. Uh, we are the fans and we know the audience and we love these stories. And so it's really for fans by fans. Um, and, and that's a lot of jargon. That's what we use in our sponsor sales pitch. Um, but like I said, Barbecue Films is an event production company. We focus mostly on events in New York because that's where we're at, but we have done events in LA. We've explored doing events in Miami, DC, and Austin. And our events go have gone as small as 35 to 50 people and as big as, uh, I think it was 1,200 people at the Mr. Robot screening. We build out the sets, we host screenings, we hire experienced AV professionals so that the film you're watching is still movie quality, but it's in a unique location. So we we also build out a storyline that is the reason that you're coming to the event. So you're not just going to watch Back to the Future, you're going to help fix the timeline. You're not just going to watch uh, Blade at Terminal 5, you're coming to help raise La Magra at Deacon Frost's uh, blade rave, blood rave from the beginning of the movie. Um, and so that's a really key piece is creating that call to action, that storyline that allows the audience to come into it. We have costumed actors, set pieces, live music, um, and really, really focusing on the details and focusing on the things from films that fans love. Um, like I said, our events are for fans by fans and similar to moviegoer, Everything started out as volunteer run and it started out from the love of the films. And so that's really what makes everything really exciting and makes people want to come back. Um, a little about the history. So where did barbecue films come from? It started in 2007 on, um, by a husband and wife who won the New York City real estate lottery with a, uh, an apartment in Harlem that had 900 square feet a 900 square foot outdoor terrace where they were also able to project films on the side of a building. And so one of the unofficial rules of barbecue films is make it more complicated. Uh, we say that as a joke because it makes our lives more difficult, um, but that was true from the beginning. <laughs> uh, so as Gabe and Lauren, the founders, um, as the screenings that they had grew in popularity, they realized that they could no longer host it on their terrace and they had to move to a bar. And so they got a space in a bar and they were screening a documentary called Below New York. And it was about subway musicians and people who make their living by playing music um, in the subway. And so they invited some of those mu musicians to actually come to the screening. And as a surprise at the end of the film, as the music is playing in the credits, these musicians stood up and harmonized with themselves as the film went off screen. And then they did a Q&A, they had a sponsored beer for it. And people came up to Gabe afterwards and said, I fell back in love with New York tonight. Like this reminded me why I love this city and why I'm here. And so he realized that there was something more to that and more people came up saying they wanted to be involved. And so that's where Barbecue Films was born. But what makes Barbecue Films great is the film crew. And what I would imagine is the same for the moviegoer, it's the people. So the film crew is a group of people who come together to brainstorm, conceptualize, design and build the events. Uh, we, like I said, we ground everything in fandom. So the ideas for what event to do next always starts here. It starts with the people. It starts with what we're excited about and what we would like to like to live. Um, we do have an ongoing list of films that we'd want to produce and events that we'd like to go to. Um, and so it also depends on finding that right key sponsor or the right space or the right 
you know, storyline that we can, the right moment in time that we can really bring all of that together and create an event. And when that happens, when we find that sponsor or we find that uh, venue, we call the crew together and we have a brain trust. And this is something really powerful and energizing where anywhere from 15 to 60 people will come together on a random Tuesday night in some random space in Manhattan, usually um, uh, one time in the New York Times building, which was a really interesting thing to get them through security. Um, but they brainstorm how to make these events come to life. So they brainstorm Empire Records, or this is from our Ghostbusters HQ event. And what's so great about it is none of these people, most of these people don't work in film. Some do, some are actors, but for the most part, we have, you know, people like me who work in media or we have someone who's a FedEx driver. We have accountants, we have software engineers and professors, people from all backgrounds coming together because they, they want to nerd out on this. And so some people come for any film because they love the process and they feel energized and they really, you know, love the cheap Domino's pizza and the Trader Joe's box wine that they get that really helps fuel the ideas. Um, but other people come because they're so excited about specific films. And so that's what's also fun. You get different expertise coming in and out depending on the event. Um, and so I'm explaining all of this. And that means that there's to get all of these people to come together to make sure we have the pizza, to make sure we have the budget and the sponsors for any event, it takes a lot of logistics. And so that's where the director's crew comes into play. And so this is a group of about 10 people. They're not all pictured here. Uh, some of these people are not involved because they moved and so we have new people there, but these are the people who deal with the logistics, who put the group together to write the script, who do coordination with sponsors and managing sponsors and finding sponsors, who scout venues, who make sure our website is up to date and is paid for, who manage our social media. Um, and, and it's all about creating the space to bring the film crew together and to bring these, um, these events into life. And so we all have day jobs and lives outside of this. And so that's also what makes it really powerful and makes it really special. Um, this picture is from a weekend where we did what we called a site site because we didn't have a meeting space, so it couldn't be an offsite. Um, and we brainstormed what we wanted to do with the company, where we wanted to take it next. Um, and so that gets us to our special sauce. So that was a lot of talking about the logistics and less about the events, but there are four key elements to making a barbecue films event happen. The first is shared story telling. You aren't watching the story happen, you're part of it. Every event has a call to action. And this picture is from our fall Foot Clan tryouts. Um, which is from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And you didn't come to see turtles as one might expect from a turtles event. You were coming to join Shredder's gang. You were getting initiated into it. You got to show up. I mean, that was the place to hang out, right? Like they had video games in Shredder's lair. They were on skateboards. They were eating pizza and junk food and having so much fun. And so we invited everyone to this warehouse in Brooklyn. We gave them pizza. We gave them beer. We had a half pipe where people were skating once they signed a waiver so that we were not liable for any <laughs> injuries. Uh, we had a video game room with bean bags. And then we had movie quality costumes and Shredder came out and he initiated people into the Foot Clan before we watched it. And the conceit for watching the film was that you know, these turtles, these halflings were back. And so we had to watch this documentary about what happened last time they were around. And so then we got to watch the film. And at the end, Partners in Crime, who produced the turtle song, the turtle power song, um, 
came onto stage and the turtles came out and there was a fight between Shredder and some ninjas and the turtles and everybody here, you can see all of their headbands are highlighted. That was a prop that they got as they came in. So even if they weren't wearing a turtle costume or a Shredder costume, they were still part of the event. They were still part of the crew um, and they got to participate in what was happening. And it really created this this moment where people felt like they were in it. And you'll see in the videos when I send them to you, there is this one quote where <laughs> this guy, he's just full character in the whole thing. We had an April O'Neil walking around interviewing people and one of the audience members get, goes over to her and, and he's like, this is the best thing. I'm in Shredder's gang. He is my leader now. I am his follower. And he was just fully bought in. And when he first walked in the door, he was like, he wasn't, he wasn't totally sure what this was going to be. Um, and so, and so that's a really important piece of how barbecue films works. Um, this is another video that we don't need to watch. There we go. Collective play is the second piece. Um, if you can't tell, this is from the Blade Rave. Uh, this is at Terminal 5. And like I said, we invited everyone to come help Deacon Frost raise La Magra, uh, which is all part of the um, all part of the Blade storyline from the first film. And what was interesting about Blade is that it's a really long film that has some kind of slow parts that aren't that exciting to watch. So what we were able to do is, as we invited everyone in and we created these different areas for people to play in, we focus more on the music and the soundtrack of Blade, which really helps immerse you in that, in that world. And we were showing clips of the film throughout most of the event. And at the end, you know, everyone's just waiting for that moment for the, the blood to drop. And at the end, we had the Crystal Method come and they come on stage. While they're on stage, they're also sitting with um, the impresario of New York, Father Sebastian, who identifies as a vampire. And he was handcrafting fangs for our VIP uh, attendees. And the Crystal Method comes on stage. We send out what we call our blood dispersal unit. And they stood around this carpeted area, this fenced in carpeted area where we had about a thousand people in the middle of Terminal 5. And as the beat drops to the song from the beginning of the movie, we start raining fake blood on them. And I, it's, it looks violent, but I have never seen more joyful people in my life. I, it was amazing. There were missed connections when missed connections was still a thing on Craigslist that said, I met you at the Blade Rave next to Deacon Frost's uh, lair. Um, you, you were wearing a blood stained white shirt, which ex was like everyone. Um, I think there were probably babies that were made that night. Um, and I definitely know some people who started dating <laughs> and people who got involved in barbecue films because they came. And so they got to, you get to play together as an adult, which doesn't always happen in your everyday life. You forget about play. Um, the third thing is authentic world building. Uh, and so it's really this magic dance between the space that you're in and the story that you're writing. So for Beetlejuice, um, we really wanted to invite everyone to come to Beetlejuice's wedding, but we also wanted a venue that felt fantastical and it felt like it could be the world. It could be that, that in-between world where Beetlejuice is hanging out with his house and there's the waiting room um, for the end of your life and you can fly. So we hosted this event at House of Yes in Brooklyn, which um, is rigged for flying. And so we had our Beetlejuice come in flying across the room. At the end, we raised up Lydia. Um, it's actually really funny because Beetlejuice now is kind of revered as this beloved character um, because of the, the cartoon and some of the other things that are in that universe. But in the film, he's, he's very much the bad guy. Um, but that way, we really 
we made the world feel real and we made people excited to be in that world. And it was easy for them to say yes to the story that we were telling. Um, and at the Beetlejuice event, um, we actually got to marry a couple because we were hosting a wedding. It was meant to be Beetlejuice and Lydia's wedding, but that doesn't happen. And we had a couple reach out to us. We put this on the website as just like a joke saying, if you wanna renew your vows or if you want Beetlejuice to marry you, um, let us know and we'll do that. And we had a couple actually come in from Philly uh, who, who actually got married at our Sunday night event and they had Beetlejuice marry them. They were in full Beetlejuice costumes. Um, it was really a very touching and strange moment to be part of. Um, and so this is from, this is a Weekend at Bernie's video that I will send to you afterwards. So part of that authentic world building is also understanding how to update these stories. Um, some of these stories wouldn't make sense in 2022 or 2015 or 2017 when we did this. And we had this opportunity to do Weekend at Bernie's at this old motel um, that had been painted in fantastical colors, neon colors, looked very 80s um, out on Rockaway Beach um, in Brooklyn and, or Queens, anyway. Um, and so we had to figure out how we could make Weekend at Bernie's work in 2015 or 2016. And the way that we did that is we said, Bernie had a kid that he didn't know about who was named Bernie Jr. And if Bernie from the movie existed in the 20 teens, what would he be? He wouldn't be a finance guy. He would definitely be a startup bro. And it wouldn't just be a startup bro. It would be a cryptocurrency startup bro. And that cryptocurrency was going to have a launch party. And the launch party was gonna be so amazing. But the reality of the cryptocurrency was that it was in such alpha that it was, it was still a printed money that you had to get. And so you, you didn't even have an app yet because he spent all the money on the party. Um, and so this video that we shot uh, is the promo for that. It's the commercial to be part of uh, Bernie Jr.'s upcoming cryptocurrency called Burn Box. And let's go. To... Oh, yeah, that's another, that's another uh, film. But then what happened is when you got to the party, uh, each room had a different interaction. And so we had a room where you could sign up to be one of the first investors in Bird Bucks. We had a room that was surveillance, that was FBI surveillance, that um, would give people different tasks that they had to do around the event. We had a room that was a VIP room where our Bernie Jr. was killed, um, and then he was dragged around the rest of the, the venue. We had a room that was um, the mob playing poker, we had a room where you could get the actual physical burn box that was uh, filled with very excited, beautiful people jumping around on beds and inviting people to come in and play. And it was amazing. It was great. The audience participated. They started posting pictures. We had journalists walk around with the fans. So the journalists who might not know that much about what we do, might not understand the storyline. We're experiencing it with people who loved what was happening and who were really excited about saying yes. Um, and, and it was great. People had a wonderful time. And again, no one had the same experience. So they were able to come back together and create that third experience of sharing it with everyone. And at the end of the night, Terry Kaiser, who played Bernie, um, taught everyone how to do the Bernie lean dance. Um, so this event is Mr. Robot. This, this still is from Mr. Robot, which um, was a TV show on USA. And we got to do a surprise season three premiere of of Mr. Robot during New York Comic Con. And eCoin was, again, it's a cryptocurrency that we ended up, you know, 
doing a lot of events around cryptocurrency. We don't know much about it, but um, we did this eCoin launch party, which is like eCoin is the bad guys. This is the bank created this cryptocurrency to control the world. And so we were again at Terminal 5 throwing this huge corporate event and we had to secretly get masks to every single attendee because at one point during the presentation, the presentation was going to be hacked and everyone had to wait for the signal to put on their mask. And so different groups of people got different assignments when they were given their mask or they had to get their mask in a different way. Some people were handed stickers that had instructions to go and talk to someone and they had to say a code word and then they got the mask. Some people had to go take a selfie and prove that they took this selfie and then they got the mask. Um, for certain people, we had them dress like cater waiters and they came in the back and we took them into the back rooms, the dressing rooms where we had set up um, some experiences where they got to hack into the presentation or they got to do recon on the president of, um, of the bank from Mr. Robot. And so by the time that they got to the screening and they got to put their masks on, they were so immersed in that world because of the things that they had done that they were able to give each other clues as to what to do, as to what to expect. And so our work was just setting up those moments for the audience to get together. And then they made it blossom. They made it into their own, um, own event. And so now, so... I've talked a little bit about the four things that go into making bar a barbecue films event, the four things that go into our storytelling and how people get involved. Um, but there are different levels of these events that we do. So the first one, the barbecue films marquee is the fully immersive screening. That's what I've been talking about for most of this. We have um, a green screen event that is much smaller. It's more intimate, it's casual. It's a cozy screening. Um, that celebrates cannabis cinema and the community that comes together around both of those um, because that's a different type of immersion. That's a different type of storytelling. Um, we have micro cinema, which we did <laughs> with Macy's for Pride, which is a three minute transportive experience where you pick one moment from the film and you walk into this room and it's projected all around you and you get to experience that one moment for, from that film for about three minutes with actors and with your friends, with a small group of friends, and then you leave and it's just like a shot of energy that you get to have, that you get to celebrate um, those, those stories with. We did Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and we did Paris is Burning. So we had a Vogue show with some Voguers, which was great. We have Rec Room, which celebrates the basement space where you fell in love with your favorite stories. This is something that's in development that we almost signed a lease and had started producing it in the end of February, 2020. And we decided to hold off on signing that lease because we didn't know what was gonna happen and that was the right choice. Um, but then this last one is experiential consulting. And so this is what we refer to as barbecue light where we can come into an existing space, an existing screening, and we can add experiential and immersive elements to it and expand the story. We did um, some screenings with a venue in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Mirage, and it leads to, oh, I'll go back to that, what we're doing next, which this is a picture of United Palace, which is up in Harlem. And this is an historical theater. Um, they do stage shows and, and movie screenings. Um, but they're trying to get people excited Sorry, about. Did you say that again? Hmm. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, that is my watch just started talking to me. Sorry about that. Um, so United Palace Theater is this old historical theater up in Harlem, and they're trying to get people excited about coming back to the movies. So they're producing a series of screenings that's free to the public free to anyone to come. And it's with all of these film favorites. And so they've act a, asked us to produce um, one or two screenings with them um, that doesn't fully transform the theatrical space, but the outdoor lobby, which is also just as beautiful and ornate. And so um, as we get into the Q&A, my question for all of you is, 
what film would you want to experience in this space? What film would you like to see and live before you go into this beautiful theater? Um, and how would you like to experience that? And so that is my presentation. Um, and I am sorry about the films not working, the, the little videos not working, but I will send those out to you. They're on our Vimeo, so they're, they're available and you can check them out. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Well, first I'll open it up. Anybody have the answer to Kat's question? I mean, I would love the like BBC Sherlock as an interactive event. I would adore that. That would be that would be a lot of fun. And what have like <clears throat> clues around that you had to that you had to find, you had to figure out. Yeah, I want to solve a mystery. <laughs> All right. I will call on people if you don't participate. So <laughs> I'm not afraid to do that. And I get to see all your names. So uh, Maya, do you have a film? I don't that know, wanted? not yeah? sure. Um, some, of the, yeah. some of the films that have been suggested are um, Indiana Jones is one that like, Professor Jones is giving a talk there and you have to come in and you get to experience some of the different things that he does that he's had to do in, in the films. Um, also films about like New York. One of the other ones we were talking about and this doesn't seem like a natural fit, um, but Men in Black because Men in Black has such a love of New York and we could have the conceit that like the only people still going to the movie after the pandemic are aliens. And so everybody who comes gets to be their favorite alien and they can show that in whatever weird way they want to. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the things. Matt, what would you want to experience? I was thinking that a Game of Thrones immersive event would be fun. There's lots to choose yeah. from there, but like something towards the end of Game of Thrones, like there's a, you know, like you, there's, there's lots of different ways that you could sort of like have certain characters take you off into different sort of aspects of this, whether you're House Stark or House, you know, Targaryen or, or, or whatever, but like being, I like the, I really like the idea that you were saying in, in the Back to the Future thing of being sort of paired up with somebody, like you're kind of part of Biff's crew yeah. or you're part of George's friends or something like that. And, and like Game of Thrones seems very sort of ripe for, for that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you're like told which house you're part of and you have to come um, and, and be a proud Stark one of the few that aren't dead. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry I mean, I for also, spoilers I also, if people haven't watched it. I, I also just came back from like Diagon Alley in Universal. So I'm sure there's there's Harry Potter yes. stuff in here as well when we're talking about choosing houses and things like that, right? Like Harry Potter is an immersive thing, whether it's Quidditch or whether it's Gringotts or, you know, there, there's lots to kind of kind of do there, I, I'm sure as well. Yeah, to play with. Um, also, if any of you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I will just keep talking about different movies and different ways to make them immersive. Um, oh, I did want to say at each event, we create a custom poster that people get to take with them. Um, and I have a few of them here. Uh, so this, this was our Enchantment Under the Sea dance. And you can see it says, Great Scott. Um, those 3D glasses were a prop from the film, but we have illustrations of George and Lorraine and Marty, and you see the DeLorean there, and that's Biff's gang, and it says the event was called Back to the Enchantment Under the Sea Dance, and so um, tried to make it look like a movie poster, and it's something, uh, I mean, all of the directors still have all of their <laughs> all of their posters, but I've actually gone to some friends' houses um, who I met through barbecue films who come as guests, and I've seen them hanging up um, in, their, in their homes 
This is a good one. We did Patrick Bateman's 27th birthday party, which is American Psycho. And so this is just the list, you know, it's all of the VHSs and it has Barbecue Films presents Patrick Bateman's 27th birthday party, but it's got handwritten, you know, The Shining, The Untouchables, um, all of these things that are, are kind of referenced in different ways um, for Patrick Bateman. Um, yeah, are there, are there any questions for me? Um, we have one from someone who had to leave, Karen. He said, how did you go about determining the aesthetic of Mr. Robot? More generally, what is your approach with determining the approach and look of a film? Yeah, um, so Mr. Robot was an interesting one uh, because it, we worked with USA on that event. And so everything that we did had to be approved by US, USA and by um, the creator of Mr. Robot. And what we were able to do we started working with them about a year and a half before the event. And so we talked them through our process and how we approached um, storytelling and how we approached creating the events. And then they talked us through where they thought the story was going to go and what they were looking for, what their goals were. So their goals, they wanted to do something that was free. So they were going to pay for it fully, which meant we didn't have to sell tickets. Um, they wanted to do something that would have at least a thousand people. So it had to be a big enough space to hold all of those people. And because it was a premiere, um, it was even more important that we nailed the quality of the screen itself and the quality of the picture. And so that kind of set the guardrails for how we picked a venue. From there, we thought about what venues we've, um, we've had, we've worked with where we had good relationships. And so we ended up at Terminal 5 because it had that industrial feel from the show as well. Um, so we don't, you don't really wanna to deviate too far from the storyline or from the feel of the show because you want people to be able to step into it. Um, and that's how we ended up at Terminal 5. Terminal 5 is also kind of a chameleon um, and we were able to make it this like corporate event and it looked like you were going to a corporate event. So it was like all blue of the, of the bank. And there was like a big E hanging from the ceiling that was, uh, neon blue. And as it switched over, like as the band on stage put their masks on and came out and they were like F society and everyone in the audience put their mask on the E turned to a red F and it came, it came down. It was like the F society was just like hacking the event. And all of that came together from the brain trust and from different conversations. So when we get together in the brain trust, we ask, you know, what is the call to action? What's a call to action that would get you to come to this event? And what are things that you would really want to do at this event? And it's really just about having those conversations with the fans and then diving into where there are really good ideas or where people got really excited. Um, Mr. Robot had the additional layer of taking those ideas and getting them approved by the client, which made things more complicated as, as we like to do. I'll ask a follow-up question to that, Kat. What was it like being nominated for an Emmy? Oh my gosh, it was, it was just the best thing ever. Uh, I uh, love TV. Um, and even like as a kid, when I thought about like, oh yeah, I want to win an award, it was always an Emmy. And so um, it was very exciting. We did not win. We lost to Westworld um, because they built Westworld. So it's fair that they won. <laughs> but it was... Yeah, it was great. It was um, like going to prom as adults with alcohol. So that was great. That was fun. I have a question. Um, I love that Barbecue Films is all about like making movies social again and making the whole like, movie going thing very social. I know that all of us like miss that, especially during COVID and like the rise of like streaming services. Do you like, like besides these like large scale production events do you kind of like predict any changes in how we watch movies that are maybe like smaller and kind of contribute to like these socializing movies again or is there anything you'd like like to see in that 
Yeah, I think it's, um, that's a really interesting question. I think there's a group of people who are just excited to go back to movies and who want to get back to the before times. And, and so for them, it's just about creating that moment and having the right film for them to come and participate in. But for this other group of people, which I kind of fall into, that's a little bit more hesitant and kind of wants to slowly get back into it and see how, um, how we're impacted. It's changing how we think about these events and changing how we think about the interaction. So we actually, I had to move this talk from last week to this week because our brain trust for United Palace was last Thursday. And, um, and so for that one, I actually ended up hosting a virtual version of the brain trust while people were there. And so I think specifically for these immersive events, it's all about finding ways to make it more accessible. It's really all about accessibility. And I think that's going to be true, you know, even for just traditional viewing of movies, you, you look, most movies are released on streaming similar at similar times to when they're in the theaters. And I think I think we might see that continue. I know that that's like not as much of a money maker, but it's it's going to be really interesting to see if audiences do go back to the movies. I actually had a question kind of that was partially addressed in the Ro Mr. Robot discussion, but I was curious as to like when you create these events, do you need permission from like the original production team of the movie or is it a completely independent like a, like are you separate from all that? So it depends. Um, for Mr. Robot, we had to run everything by them because it was a new story. For um, Ghostbusters, our Ghostbusters event, we did work with Sony um, who owns the rights to Ghostbusters, but we didn't work with their new release division. We worked with their licensing division, which is a very small department in most studios that is all about creating this ongoing legacy revenue. And so they're the ones that are giving licenses to movie theaters or to um, you know, school projects or things like that to be able to show and make money off of watching a movie. We're actually um, listed as, we're, we're technically a movie theater with most of these studios because we do create a space where you come and you sit down and you watch a film. And so um, the license that we get is one for a movie theater, um, but it does, it depends on the property too. So for also with Twin Peaks, um, we were working with the marketing department. So we did have to get certain approvals from David Lynch and from Showtime, but it was mostly working with marketing and working with the guidance and the guardrails that the marketing team had. Okay. But yeah, they were very particular about like what images we could have of Laura Palmer and like how we were allowed to show different things, which makes sense. It's a, it's a very, it's a very well done show. So we wanted to do it. We want to do it right. I was also thinking that a good immersive experience would be one for a show I'm watching now, which is Dexter. Cause mm. I think like a good, like murder story, like where you're kind of like running around, like the whole area would be good. Yeah. I Dexter is great because he's also a detective. So you have like those two interactive pieces playing together. It's kind mm. of like that, that Sherlock piece and American psycho tied together. Mm. That would be fun. I would go to that. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> yeah, the kill room sounds perfect for this. <laughs> so so we're, we're a bunch of undergrads with the love of the movies. We run a website that we write, that we all write for. Um, you've had lots of sort of different sort of moments in your career and you've done a lot of stuff and you've, you're sort of a, 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 a master at the figuring out of things. Yeah. What advice would you give somebody for sort of starting on that path of their career or like, how does somebody sort of 
leave college and sort of embark on this kind of journey like as you as we were talking about before like we're we're all of different kind of backgrounds some of us are in software amazon criminology you know like a, a lot of us are, are sort of you know very different here but like what what what's you know talk to us a little bit about sort of how to navigate some career advice yeah i think um one of the things that was so difficult for me when I was first starting my career was feeling the weight of every single decision that I was making and feeling like I had to do everything perfect all the time because that job, that next job or that next project was going to make or break me. But it's okay if you make mistakes and it's okay if you take a job and you think it's going to be your dream job and you think it's going to be perfect and it's not exactly right there are still going to be things that are good about it but you can find ways finding people that you like to work with is so key because that will make the job better and there's always an opportunity to find your crew to find your film crew to find your moviegoer crew so it doesn't you don't have to get everything out of your career um, it really is about going and trying different things. And if you try something and you learn that you don't like it, that's great. That's a step forward. And that's, that's about learning. Learning what you don't like is just about learning. It is just as important as learning what you do like. Um, I don't know if that's helpful advice, uh, but I just, I remember feeling like everything, there was such a weight on every th single thing that I did. And as soon as that pressure kind of left, I was able to move around more freely and try different things and feel more comfortable in experimenting and taking risks. And that's how I found barbecue films. I have a question along those lines. So I'm someone who'll be going to like generic tech after college, but like I love movies and maybe like someday I want to combine that with entertainment. And I did like stalk your LinkedIn before this. And it seems that like, although you've like been a product manager, program manager, like you've kept this like thread of always being involved in entertainment in some capacity. So like what sort of advice would you give to somebody who like wants to go along that path, but maybe take like a less traditional route to it? Yeah. Um, I think that you just talk to people. The thing with entertainment, the entertainment industry is that it's all about connections and it's all about being willing to talk to people and ask them questions. Um, and I think that the more relationships that you build that way, the better. Um, I would also, you know, it's, it feels really difficult to break into that industry, but it's, you know, it's just about finding that like right one connection that you can get into. And also, you know, when you are, I sound so old when I'm going to say this, um, when you are young and you have a lot of energy and time having these things like barbecue films that are these side hustles that you're learning about and that I was able to make a ton of mistakes in barbecue films um, because we were all making mistakes together and we were all learning and figuring out together um, in a way that I wasn't doing that hopefully in my day job. Matt may, may think differently. I may have been making all of those mistakes in my day job too, but <laughs> um, I think it really is just about not being afraid to reach out and talk to people and build those relationships. Yeah, yeah because... I, would, I would definitely agree about finding your crew inside, yeah. inside of a job, even if you don't like the job. And like Kat and I, and then we have like our lead engineer and our lead designer, yeah. the four of us, like, like Kat said, we have a group chat and we chat like almost every day. There's usually something going on and we haven't worked together for five or six years. But the relationship of our working sort of connection while we were at the New York Times was so strong. Um, and, you know, it was really like we kind of caught lightning in a bottle because we, we, we worked hard, but we also played hard as well. Uh, and like Kat and I spoke at, an, a, a, at a conference in Barcelona and, um, you know, we, we sort of traveled as a, as, a, as a team and we sort of had to navigate this tremendous sort of internal upheaval of the time that was going on at the New York Times. And our group was right in the middle of the, all of it. And it was really these relationships and our, our sort of very strong sort of respect uh, and, and sort of 
you know, a sort of love for each other, if you like, that that sort of kept that really strong. And, um, you know, we're all in different jobs now. Like Kat's at LinkedIn, I'm at NBC, our engineer is at Google, and our designer is at Apple. But like, we're still very, very, very close in terms of, you know, just chatting with each other about what's important. We're friends. Yeah, and I think, yeah, what Matt was saying about having those people that you can rely on when the turmoil is happening is so important. Um, and because change is constant at work, like there's always going to be a reorg, there is always going to be changing priorities or something that comes up that you're going to have to address. But if you have people that you're working with that you trust and that you can say, oh, I'm so stressed out about this thing. I, I can't believe what's going on. I mean, Matt will tell you a story about how I compared one of our vendors to Aaron Burr. Uh, when Hamilton first came out and I was very upset about what he was doing and may have been stomping around saying that he was Aaron Burr, maybe wasn't doing that, but I was. Um, but it was good that I was able to get that out and then sit down and put together a rational email to send to him and make sure that that relationship didn't implode because I was mad at what he was saying. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's, that's really key. And just remember too, if you're afraid to reach out to someone, like I'm, I'm never upset if someone reaches out to me, I would guess that none of you are upset if someone were to reach out to you and say, Hey, do you want to get a coffee? Hey, do you want to get lunch together? Hey, I'd love, I'd love to hear about what you would do. And just keep that in mind when you're working up the nerve to, ask someone to go get lunch or ask someone to go get coffee at your first job. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We don't want to keep you too long, Kat. I'm sure you're very busy with your, your side hustles. Yeah, I actually do have a just a very like small question, but how do you have time? <laughs> For everything? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I didn't start running the Airbnb until the pandemic and Barbecue Films was like kind of not doing much at the time. Um, but I think it is also about finding the team. It's It goes back to finding the teams that you can work together with. Um, with the Airbnb, I am now finding a company that can help me manage it. So I don't have to do all the day to day, but I was able to set up that system and hand it off to them. Um, with Barbecue Films, it's a group of 10 directors who are running things. So if one of us says, hey, I can't do this right now because I'm sick or because I am really busy at work or because of something else, other people can fill in. And especially with your side hustles, um, it's really important to make sure that it doesn't just fall on you, that you have people that can help you out. Okay, well, thank you so, so much for coming to talk to us. Um, this was really awesome. I want to take a moviegoer field trip to New York to go to a <laughs> barbecue films event really badly now. Um, well, well, maybe if, if there is a way, maybe Barbecue Films will have a chapter in Pennsylvania and we could do an event there. That's um, really so we'll all be there. <laughs> it sounds like we have a natural brain trust happening already. Um, but also if there are other questions that you have, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Obviously that's a, an easy way to reach out to me, um, but I'm I'm happy to to chat more and always happy to to message back and forth if you have other questions. Thank Amazing. you so much for all of this. This was so fun. Oh, Thanks I'm so, so glad. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. This was great. This is the first time I've had to talk about barbecue films publicly in a while, so this was fun. I get I'm getting back into my stride. You sold me. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right thanks so much cap bye, bye thank cap. you thank you